Good afternoon, and you are very welcome to the opening of the academic year here at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, 2022-2023. Now, as the cortege was walking in, something struck me. I think this is the first time that we've all been together in such numbers in three years. I think it's a fantastic gathering to see, and I think we should have a round of applause for that fact, that we're all here together. I'm Barry Fitzgerald, Science Communication Officer here at TUE, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's program. And we have some exceptional guests in this program, with the theme being technological sovereignty. In particular, a special word of welcome to our panelists and speakers, and they include EU Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton. Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, Miki Adrians. <laughs> ASML CEO, Peter Venick. <laughs> and President of Philips Netherlands, Sylvia van Es. <laughs> so what can you expect from today's program? Well, we have a number of speeches, from some of our guests, and then we also have a panel discussion, and we have some other surprises too. We also have an official virtual opening of the new Neuron Campus building, and of course we will conclude with the official opening speech of our Rector Magnificus, Frank Byans, which will be followed by the official opening of the academic year. Right, let's get started. And to start off, I'd first like to invite President of TUE, Robert Jan Smits to the stage to say a few words. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And let me also, from my side, uh, welcome all of you, those being present here today in this beautiful auditorium, and those joining us online through the Science Business Link Up. There's one person I would like, however, to welcome in particular, and that is our mayor, John Joritsma. John, can you please stand up? <laughs> and I'm doing that since this is the last academic year, opening of the academic year, you are attending in your current capacity as mayor of Eindhoven. And I would like to use this occasion to thank you on behalf of the TUE community for your enormous friendship, for your enormous support, for your enormous contribution, not just to the city, not just to the region, but also to the university. You have been always an enormous friend of the university. We could call upon you night and day, and I think uh, that is something which we will remember. We wish you all the best for the future. We hope you stay in touch, and I think you deserve another round of applause for John Jorisma, our mayor. Now the, now, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has made Europe's dependence on other countries more than ever visible and apparent, be it on the production of mouth masks or medical components, or be it with regard to uh, the chips, microchips, or platforms such as Zoom and Teams, where we're completely dependent on other countries. And now, with the war in Ukraine, it has become very clear that Europe is again vulnerable and dependent as regards oil and gas supply and certain foodstocks. And yes, I should absolutely add to this the crisis, the crisis in the Far East and Asia, which might have huge consequences for the supply of microchips to Europe, and not just to Europe, to the world at large. And for this reason, the plans of the European Commission aimed at greater European autonomy and sovereignty are to be welcomed. And in this context, the CHIPS Act, under the dynamic leadership of you, Commissioner Breton, stands out with its ambitious aim to increase Europe's position on the world market with regard to chip production from 8 to 20% by 2030. Now, this afternoon, we will discuss Europe's plan aims at sovereignty and autonomy. And we will notably focus on the CHIPS Act and we'll ask some of questions such as are these measures fit for purpose? How far can and should Europe go 
to reach technological sovereignty? In other words, what should be the balance between openness and autonomy? And what contribution can Europe's industry and universities make to realize this ambitious agenda? Are companies ready and able to shorten their supply chains or to reshore? And is it fair in this context to ask the question to the companies, don't ask what Europe can do for you, but ask yourself what you can do for Europe? There could not be a better place to discuss these matters than here in Eindhoven, where the high-tech industry and the university are holding a winning hand when it comes to achieving the European ambitions. Furthermore, we know here in Eindhoven, and we have shown that, that through cooperation you can deliver miracles and get things done. So let's not get started. Barry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Jan Smits. You'll be hearing again from the president of TUE again later in the program when we delve into further details on the theme of today's opening of the academic year, which is technological sovereignty. All right, let's get started then with our very first speaker of today. And it is an absolute honor to welcome on behalf of TUE our first speaker to the stage. Please, can you all give a very warm round of applause to the EU Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton. Well, it's very good to be here together with you and uh, professors, students, and of course, uh, dear Mickey, uh, Minister Adrian, President of the University, um, Rector Magnificis, my friends, member of the European Parliament, uh, dear Mayor, very happy that uh, you waited for this event. <laughs> you put some pressure on us. Huh? Uh, so, I'm extremely, extremely happy and honored to, uh, to be here today to, uh, to address um, uh, you about uh, technological sovereignty. Two words. One I love, technological. I'm an engineer, like all of you. Sovereignty is a little bit more complex. It's complex because it means many, many things. Uh, but probably um, uh, it, uh, it means that uh, we are definitely in a changing environment and that we need to see this environment, uh, let's say, with new eyes. Of course, sovereignty could mean uh, autonomy, sometimes uh, could mean resilience. Uh, some could say strategic autonomy, some will say open strategic autonomy. Well, for me, sovereignty means to make sure that we have everything in our hands to do what we have to do. And we, as politicians, uh, an EU commissioner is not only an engineer or former engineer, it's a politician, we need to make sure that uh, all the companies, all the industries, and all 450 million European uh, uh, um, uh, fellow citizens will have what it needs to continue to make Europe the first democracy and the biggest democracy in the free world, at least in number, 450 million inhabitants, I put of course uh, India aside, one and a half bigger than the United States. <laughs> Give us a lot of responsibility, but this is what we are. But also the first market, with internal market. Um, and of course, uh, that's, that's quite a challenge. Because we have seen over the past few months, years, um, a lot of things changing. Energy security, food security, 
health security, military security, cyber security. I mean, this is part of our daily news. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, behind that, I mean security of supply in this moving environment uh, to be able to produce what we have to produce here in Europe uh, uh, based on our rules and, uh, and value. And it's true that when we see the evolution of the geopolitics, and you need to see it, even as students, that's extremely important, uh, we see a major fragmentation, a lot of changes. Uh, uh, we see China moving. Uh, we saw uh, the United States with uh, this uh, America first concept. Fortunately, it's not here again, but we'll see. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, of course, uh, the war now in Ukraine, um, the war decided by Vladimir Putin against uh, Ukraine, but also, let's be honest, sort of an hybrid war against, uh, against Europe and our values. Uh, so in fact, we could say that we are living now in uh, uh, what I will call an era of uh, perma-crisis, pandemic, climate change, of course, uh, uh, Russia war, and so on. And in these circumstances, we learn something. We learn that um, our dependencies in these very situations could be or have been used against us. Doesn't mean, of course, and I will come back on this later on, that we need to do everything on our own. Of course not. But we need to realize, if you look, for example, uh, at what happened uh, uh, in Russia, that all our dependencies could be weaponized. And, uh, and, and, and we know that, uh, of course, when we look at energy, including the last uh, event, including for today, uh, there have been used against us. So this is why, more than ever, we decided that we needed to decouple, at least from Russia, all our uh, dependencies. But of course, without uh, self-isolating ourselves, that's obvious. Uh, but thinking differently, accelerating our strategy with more green energy, finding new partners, and uh, preparing uh, structural reforms, including for all our energy market uh, and electricity market. If we look at defense, same thing. Let's be honest. Uh, for the past 20 years, Europe did not invest in defense. We are thinking that we could do it uh, with others, others, by the way, paying for us. And um, if we look at uh, defense budget, we in Europe collectively uh, increased our defense budget by 20% over the past 20 years. Sometimes uh, uh, Russia uh, increased by 300%. U.S. 60 percent, and China more than 600 percent. So, I mean, it means that, of course, things are changing around us and that we realize that we need to do something probably together. I'll come back on this in a few minutes. In technology, of course, uh, we have recognized that a global race is taking place and, of course, that our capacity to take our destiny into our hands depends, of course, on our capacity to monitor these technologies. And by the way, uh, it's true, of course, in digital technologies, but it's true also in green technologies, uh, which are extremely important, because I just remind you that our goal is to become a zero CO2 continent by 2050. It's called the Green Deal, and that in order to do this, we need to be able to produce all our energy to being totally decarbonized. That's a huge challenge. But of course, we have a lot, a lot of good uh, things. I hate, by the way, to hear that Europe is lacking in technology. We have so many things in Europe. Uh, we have so many fantastic companies. Uh, Peter, uh, 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 you're on one of them, uh, ASML. Uh, you know, when, I, when, when, when my US friends were telling me, oh, there's no, US, no, no big European companies in technology. I said, give, give me a, a, company, a European company in technology where market share is one and a half bigger than, let's say, Intel, SML. Second, I think, or something like that, largest market cap in Europe. Congratulations, uh, Peter, but uh, I know that you will continue on this. And it means, and we are all very proud of that. 
but it means that, of course, we have so many things here that I think it's extremely important to, um, to make uh, this clear to, um, to, to, to everyone. This being said, of course, um, um, we are entering into a new era uh, where supply chains and sustainability of supply chains will be probably one of the most important things, and this is what we learn again uh, during uh, this uh, past crisis that I, I, just, uh, I just remind. And of course, uh, uh, globalization will continue. I mean, I, I, I read sometimes that people say, oh, it's the end of globalization. So, no, absolutely not. Uh, we are a planet, we are a continent. But, and I say this to all the my, uh, my young uh, colleague here. We are, for the first time in our history, a planet with soon more than 8 billion inhabitants. <laughs> and it never happened on our planet. <laughs> and it means that we probably need to realize that we need to change things. It never happened. At the beginning of the past century, it was a little bit more than one billion. So it means that, of course, we need to be careful with what we do with the planet. Climate change. Climate change. Because, of course, we interact. We need to be careful with how we extract what is needed with the raw materials and everything. We need to be careful with health. Eight billion people moving together. You mentioned it the first time that we meet, that we convene again since the past three years. More pandemic, probably. We need to be able to food, to feed, of course, eight billion inhabitants. With Africa, by 2050, with more than 2.5 to 3 billion inhabitants. And, uh, and education, and uh, negotiating, and uh, um, uh, trades. So everything will have to be taken in consideration, including, of course, all uh, the um, um, uh, consequences in terms of geopolitics. So in this environment, uh, I want to speak, to speak about sovereignty, about three things. First, self-assurance. Second thing, solidarity, and that may be a, a, a vision. Self-insurance. That's absolutely uh, 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 paramount. I just would like to quote here uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, uh, saying that uh, economic independence doesn't mean self-efficiency. And I cannot say better than that. We will never do everything on our own in Europe. We will need to reorganize ourselves to make sure that, uh, um, uh, uh, of course, our approach will continue to be an open continent. And as a trading nation here in Netherlands, you know this better than everyone, it is extremely important. We are an open continent. But of course, we need also, when uh, we are interacting with our partners, to, uh, to explain uh, 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 what it means to, uh, to be uh, lucky enough to be able to benefit from the European internal market. And everyone could benefit, but we have rules. By the way, in Europe, continental Europe, we are driving on the right side of the road. So if you build a car to drive on the left side, too bad. But change it, and you will be welcome. That's our rules. Open, yes, but with some conditions, just because we are what we are. But remember, our, our goal, and as, as politicians, as a, a European Commission, with member states, is to explain clearly to the company what are these rules. Uh, so uh, 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 again, um, uh, and that's why I always say that we need to be clear, but we need also to know what are our strengths. And we need to be proud of our strengths. We have a lot of strengths in Europe. Unbelievable. By the way, I see more and more of uh, students coming back from the US to, the, to Europe. It's fantastic. I, I love it. Uh, um, when I was your age, I decided to go to the US. I started my own company in the US. Uh, but then, 
I missed Europe. And I came back, and I'm a European commissioner. So maybe some of you will, be, will become a European commissioner. Be careful, huh? it could happen to you. Huh? It was not in my career plan, huh? but, uh, but because we have so many strengths and also attractivity, uh, I really think that, uh, and I don't want to speak about everything, but you know this better in this part of, of Europe, uh, um, with so many huge companies where you invented so many things. Uh, we spoke about ADS, uh, ASML, we will speak about, of course, of uh, Philips. Uh, we are always impressed with Philips. The capacity to reinvent itself is just impressive. Always reinventing itself. That's really amazing. So, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the second thing I wanted to, to tell you is uh, um, um, uh, more self-assurance uh, regarding our ability to set also uh, uh, our rule of the game means also to have our own standards. And I think it's extremely important. I hate when I hear, oh, in Europe, you're extremely good, at regu uh, you're good to regulate. No, we don't regulate. We just put rules. Take, for example, what we did with uh, the DSA and the DMA. You know, this uh, new uh, uh, law now that have been voted by our uh, European Parliament and Council, uh, uh, which is enforceable now, uh, to make sure that, that in the digital space, we have rules. Everything which is authorized in our physical space, of course, will be authorized in the digital space. But everything which is forbidden in the physical space will be forbidden also. It took centuries to build our way to live together, to organize uh, our activity, your economical activity uh, 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 on the ground, physically. But of course, in the digital space, it was the Wild West. So we just decided in Europe that we needed to have just some rules. And you know, not of course here, but I know uh, uh, some uh, 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 of your age spending um, 40, 45% uh, of their time uh, uh, navigating on the, on the digital space. I mean, it means that when you have children, believe me, uh, it was quite, quite an issue and quite a problem, so we had just to uh, organize this. And this is why I say, I hate to say regulate, we just organize uh, what we have to do. That's also uh, uh, what I mean by self-insurance. Uh, and the last thing uh, regarding our shelf insurance means our ability to establish, let's say, uh, a balance of power. At the end of the day, and if there is one word also that I would like you to remind, balance of power. When uh, you are um, uh, creating partnership, and business is about partnership, and technology is about partnership, and science and research is about partnership, cooperation, I mean, you need to bring something to others. When I was a CEO, I hired many, many engineers in my life. I never asked, Give me your CV. Give, give, me, give, give, me, give, give me your resume. I just asked, my first question was, do you have a passion? Then, of course, uh, passion, uh, yes, a passion. Could be soccer, could be opera, could be uh, ice skating. Do you have a passion? And then I was extremely interesting to listen to your passion. Because if you have a passion, and now you all have a passion, it means that there is probably one era where you decided, because you like it, to be the best, to learn and to continue, because when you are, when you are the best, you want to be even better. So you have a fantastic area of expertise. And it means that you know, probably, how to share this passion with others. And then you know also how to receive what the other will give you, cooperation dialogue, exchange. And because you have a strength, you can learn from the strengths of others. But in business, it's the same thing. I mean, you cannot depend on anything from others. You need also to bring something on the table. And that's what we are doing in Europe. We decided, for example, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the chips, that there's some areas where we are the best in the world. Peter, SML is one of them but we have others in R&D. So we have something to put on the table. 
And then, of course, we can exchange. Let me give you an example. I have been in charge 18 months ago, almost two years ago, of the vaccine strategy of the, of the, of the Union. It was really a nightmare. Remember, just after the beginning of the COVID, we were lacking of everything. And then, because of, by the way, European research, we have been able, and thanks to European research, and by the way, European funding, we have been able to present, to put the first time, mRNA vaccines on the table, and it worked, and they have been approved. But then the question was how to manufacture it. It was quite a challenge. And of course, I got the tar baby in the commission. So Try to work, put everything together, working with the supply chain, um, enhancing the capacity of production with uh, uh, factories, which was something totally uh, from scratch. And then I realized that uh, uh, part of our components uh, were uh, built uh, in the US in some um, uh, manufacturing, European manufacturers, plants that we had installed in the US. But then the US decided that because of this pandemic, and I don't blame anyone, it was a policy, they decided to put a ban until we got herd immunity in the US, nothing will leave the US. And I enter into uh, contact with my, uh, my counterpart. And I said, Jeff, this is my factory. These are our components. Oh, sorry, Thierry. We have a ban. Look, but there's a supply chain. No, no. So we said, come back. We said, OK, uh, we'll do the same. Because we had a lot of things, by the way, including here, in excellence, drug substance, manufacturer not too far from here very important for Johnson & Johnson. And then we decided we will send it if we get what we have, what we need, reciprocity. We had some strengths, and because of these strengths, we have been able to reopen the supply chain. That's an example of what I mean with balance of power. Even with your best partner, it was the so-called uh, America first principle. You heard that? By the way, it was with the Biden administration, not with the Trump. So it means that you better be ready. Of course, it's very important to our friends. It's very important to, uh, to, to be able to trust them. But the stronger you are, the better it will be. And that's really something I think we need to have in mind. And this uh, balance of power is definitely something that we put in place. Now, for many things around us, not everything, of course, but we have identified, um, uh, uh, let's say, few supply chains, semiconductors, for example, are absolutely critical. We cannot depend on uh, tech, tech Taiwan. In Taiwan, uh, between uh, 50 to 75 percent, I say between 50 to 75, huh, of, the, of, the, of the production uh, uh, of, the, of, of, of the key uh, um, uh, semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. Let's imagine that for a reason Taiwan is blocked tomorrow, could happen. Huh? You read the newspaper. In less than two weeks, right? No more manufacturing capacity in, in, in the world. All the manufacturers, on almost every, everywhere, you need semiconductors. Stop. So it means that, of course, uh, we needed to probably to rebalance. Do not do everything again, but rebalance. And this is where we decided to increase a little bit our production and our capacity of to produce in Europe, not everything again, but being able here to have the kind of exchange I had with my counterpart, Jeff Zayans, in the vaccine from what we learned. So we need here again not to be naive. We need to understand that we are a big continent and that our strength is because we are a big continent. That's fantastic. And that's probably something very rare on the planet. It's a fantastic opportunity, but it's also your duty. You will have to make it work uh, for us and maybe, uh, and maybe for, for, for others uh, around, uh, around us. And by the way, um, uh, we, are, we need to be careful also with raw materials. Let's take the Green Deal. We are now in the process 
to uh, manufacture and to develop huge uh, um, uh, green capacity uh, in terms of energy, solar panels, uh, windmills, and so on. But of course, you need raw materials, you need permanent magnet, you need many things to do that. We are in the process to have, uh, by 2035, only electric cars in Europe, but you need, of course, batteries, you need lithium, uh, you need all these materials. So it doesn't mean that we will do everything on our own, because we don't have it. But it means that we need uh, here also to rebalance it, uh, uh, maybe to start to reopen some mines that we have in Europe, and we have. We have identified that we could have probably between, let's say, 30 or 35 percent of what we need in Europe, as long as we do it properly, respecting environment, respecting our values, respecting biodiversity, respecting, of course, the population, making sure that there is no risk, uh, using technology, using research, using science to do it properly, using satellites, using quantum technologies to see under the ground with gravimetry, using all the kind of things that we can do to do it on a clean way. And by the way, while doing this, maybe giving some ideas for our suppliers to do the same thing in the interest of the planet. So, of course, we are doing this, but we are doing this always with in mind the reciprocity. Uh, uh, so we look, for example, what happened uh, in the US. Uh, um, uh, I, I talk about the um, um, US uh, defense production uh, and uh, uh, the DPA that was used for the vaccine. Uh, now the US are putting uh, Infection uh, uh, Reduction Act so we need to do things again in balance. Level playing field is extremely, extremely uh, important um, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. And, uh, and, and, and in this uh, context, um, uh, Mickey, if you allow me, I would like to, to make to cite uh, you. Uh, uh, you said, and I, I really love it, that's why I, I would like to share it with, with the audience. Um, um, you said that what once was is no more. We are just being overtaken by other great powers. At some point, you have to move with what is happening. That is not protectionist. I prefer to speak of healthy realism. That's healthy realism, but not protectionism. So that's definitely uh, my, uh, my vision. And, uh, and then I want to move quickly with the second point, which is solidarity. Uh, no sovereignty, no autonomy, or let's say being able to monitor your destiny in your hands without solidarity. What makes Europe what it is? We are based on rule of law, we share our values, and this is a solidarity. We learn it all again during the COVID-19 crisis. We have been able, in less than one year, to become, from scratch, the first continent in terms of manufacturing vaccines. For us, before the US, before China, less than one year. But also for the rest of the world. Because we decided that half of the production will be for our fellow citizens, and half will be exported for the rest of the countries contrary to our US friends, who decided to keep everything until they got herd immunity. These are our values. We are a continent based on shared values and rule of law. And shared value means shared. And that's the same thing. And we share everything with the vaccines. We brought it together. So that's also what we try to do now uh, uh, as a, a reaction with the Russian uh, aggression in Ukraine. We decided together, first, to answer to the needs and to request of, uh, of um, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. And we did it together. We decided together to enhance our defense budget now and to share our expertise and to buy together. And this was probably totally impossible to think 10 years ago. And we are, decide we are deciding now, as I speak, to sit together and to work together and to share our resources in energy. This is already what's happening. Already, when a country needs something, electricity, the other one is giving electricity. When a country needs gas, the other one needs gas. It's happening now. And we know that we will be able to overcome the situation because of uh, this uh, um, uh, solidarity. And it means changing a lot of things. 
Think of nuclear energy. It has been very controversial, especially in some countries like Germany and Belgium. We know that, and we respect it. But to make sure that they will be able to provide what is needed for them and for their neighbors, I mean, the Belgian government has decided not they wanted to, 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 to shut down all the nuclear plants, to continue to produce it uh, uh, for them and for others. And it's changed. it was a total change in their mindset and political vision. Same thing for Germany. So, I mean, of course, here, uh, um, uh, I just wanted to tell you that solidarity is definitely something that we learn during this crisis. And I think it's definitely now part of our European DNA. And, uh, and uh, so, if I want to recall, you see, not be naive, understand where are our strengths, be proud of what we are, of course, reasonably proud, huh? by the way, we are 450 million inhabitants on a planet of 8 billion. Be modest, huh? We be modest, but it gives us an obligation also regarding others, including regarding Africa, which is our closest neighbor on the four time zones on this planet, from south to north, you will have more than 40% of the population living. 500 on the north, 3 billion on the south. That's a big responsibility, of course, uh, uh, for us. The final point I wanted to tell you is that, of course, for all of this, we will need a lot of innovation. Here you are. A lot of science, a lot of technology. That's a fantastic time, I mean, uh, to, uh, to embrace all these challenges. And at the end of the day, that's why we need engineers. So you will have definitely a goal for your life. But things bigger than you, things bigger than your country, Think bigger as a new company. What you will do in digital, in health, in technology, in, uh, um, in green energy will be, of course, for us, but for others. And they will need us. But we need also, on top of that, to pay for it. That's a huge amount to transform a continent with this green transition. Huge get rid of all fossil energy within one generation, from now till 2050. In your generation, your objective is to get rid of all fossil energy. That's obviously a huge challenge. We need to pay for it. And this is why it's extremely, extremely important to make sure that we will have the, the right amount of money of course, we will probably borrow. Uh, it will create some new debt. We need to, to, uh, to cope with it. We have already the debt inherited from uh, our legacy. This new debt and the third debt, which is also the CO2 debt that we need to get rid of. So that's a big challenge for your generation. And uh, personally, I think it is here uh, in Eindhoven in theory, the best place to tackle these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, EU Commissioner Thierry Breton, for the very inspiring speech. And we will get the opportunity to hear more from Commissioner Breton during the panel discussion. We are now on to our next speaker who will provide a national perspective on the theme at hand. I'm just going to do a quick check and make sure that we have everything in place. We do. Excellent. Can you please give a very warm welcome to the Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy here in the Netherlands, Vicky Adriens. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is really a pleasure to be here today. I'm here because we're here. We have the people, all the people we need to make the transition. Monsieur Breton was talking about. 
The transition will, will take us forward. We have the students, we have the businesses, and we have the governmental organizations. And together, you make Brainport Eindhoven, where we are today, a leading force at international level, where development, investment and collaboration, which was already mentioned how important that is, we have it go hand in hand here, advancing technology and creating jobs. And also, I would like to add, earning money for the Netherlands as a whole. And in the end, also for the European Union, because it goes with, a, with no say that it's connected. So I can imagine that this is a very exciting place for a student to be in this time, right here, right now. Because it's you, the students, who are also here in this hall, I'd like to address first. Because today marks the opening of the academic year. And at this university, you can not only start claiming your place in the world, you can also start changing the world. And that's a responsibility. You can take progress a step further. And you can do that alone. Of course, you cannot do that alone. The university, the businesses and the governmental organizations are here to help you. And besides having fun and making new friends, which is also very, very important, you will be working hard to get a grip on the latest technologies, the latest knowledge, science, which will lead to innovations that people are waiting for. The innovations that will solve the problems we are facing, that combat climate change, that sees the opportunities presented by digitalization. The Netherlands wants to lead the way in this. We really want to be there in the front position, and we really need your input. In this way, you can contribute to science and technology for the greater prosperity of us all. And to the CEOs here today, with the new jobs you're creating and all the innovation in the pipeline, you can certainly use all the talent here present in this hall. Because with young talent and investment, we can put knowledge into practice. We can take it from the lab to the market and turn it into products, and I add again, into profits, because then the system will work automatically. And valorization is a very important driver of our economy. We have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of expertise, but my goal is to make sure that we use that knowledge and that expertise in the working places, in the market, in the economy, that we will make products with it, so that it really will be put into practice, because that will strengthen our economy. And innovation can also help us tackle the global problems, as I mentioned before, whether it's climate, energy or digitalization or problems we're facing with healthcare and so further. In short, they help improving the world and earning a living. And I think it's very important that the knowledge from labs and lecture halls like this is applied in business, because that's how we accelerate innovation in areas like photonics or quantum technology. Take, for instance, Smart Photonics, which was co-founded by this university, and I recently paid a visit to that company, one of Europe's most promising startups. It's a fine example of parties working together. It's, it's a fine example of how knowledge and R&D are going hand in hand with making prog prog products you can sell. And it shows that national and international collaboration is essential. And many European countries, they have knowledge that others can benefit from. And allowing us to innovate even more and even faster. So I would really have a pledge that we should share that more. And another good example is also the semiconductor industry, which was also mentioned by Mrs. Mr. Breton. And I was able to see for myself what a tremendous innovative power this Dutch company has, as well as an extensive network, which is I think one of the key issues there, an extensive network of local and international partners, 
Collaboration allows, enables also ASML and other parties to develop advancing chip making machines, which produce almost all the chips that are needed in the IT, in the climate transition, in the healthcare, which are machines very ahead of their time. And I would like to see closer cooperation in Europe so that we can compete even more successfully with the rest of the world. And I need the help of the students for this. And I see that we are, you are very, uh, also very international already. So connect to each other and share the knowledge because we will benefit all from that. And another example of innovation is a new generation of batteries developed by the whole center right here in Eindhoven with the aim of gaining an edge on the rest of the world. It is important that the Netherlands and Europe become less dependent on other countries when it comes to manufacturing essential technologies like batteries or microchips or other value change. And it also means that we can provide good jobs here in, the, in North Brabant, for instance, but also in the Netherlands as a whole, for thousands of people. And does that mean that I think the Netherlands should close the door on companies from outside Europe? No, I don't. As a trading nation, the Netherlands benefits greatly from being an open economy. We use that to our advantage. Contact with other cultures, with researchers from all over the world, and with foreign students provides us with additional knowledge and economic benefits. But at the same time, it's very important that this international cooperation does not compromise our national security. An open economy that does not mean that we are oblivious to threats and geopolitical developments. There are limits if openness damages our position or sensitive technology. For example, if this technology can be used against us militarily. There are limits when we become too dependent on other countries, when we can no longer represent our own interests independently, because that's very essential that we stay independent. That's why new legislation will soon allow the government to assess investments in companies. And that's a new thing we do. And why we are looking more closely at protecting critical knowledge. In this way, we aim to prevent the transfer of knowledge and technology from having a negative impact on national security. It is important to find the right balance between openness where possible and protection when needed. And this allows us to attract knowledge and retain it at the same time, to create a level playing field while stimulating innovation and safeguarding our security and our independence. And together with our European partners, we can stand firm on the world stage. There's a reason why the main port of Eindhoven has a main port status. It's really a word, it's main port and why the Dutch government is investing in the business climate here. And that's because of the collaboration. The collaboration which was also mentioned before, which is a very strong value we have. Bringing together talented young people, bringing together knowledge institutions, universities and businesses, which is a golden combination. It's a pleasant, it's very important that you also have a pleasant place to live. It's even, it's, I think, the same, it has the same importance as a pleasant place to work. So the government is look, looking very hard how we can improve this. To safeguard the liveability in this region, for instance, with student housing and bigger homes for graduates so that they will stay here and work here. And it's also important that traffic flows are regulated so that people can easily move from work to home and the campus to their houses. And there also should be appealing cultural activities for students and for working professionals. Good facilities, 
they are very much needed here, so the government is looking into ways to improve that here in Eindhoven, and Eindhoven itself, the brain port, is looking for ways to improve it. And in the, Europe in the European Union, the Netherlands is committed to keeping businesses competitive and at the forefront of innovation. Because we used to think that business communities should take care of themselves. But with everything which is happening in the world right now, the Dutch government must play an active part. We all should play an active part, but the government has a role there. And that's why we give financial support to Dutch companies and knowledge institutions that collaborate on strategic innovation products in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you work for a government, whether you work in business or research, or you are a student, we all hope that Eindhoven University will produce engineers who are equipped to find solutions to help solving the changes we face in the world. Solutions that will improve the health for individuals, for instance, with sensors that detect kidney failure of all other applications. Solutions that will strengthen our economy and enable us to live more sustainable lives, because that's what we all want. And these solutions that will depend heavily on you students here present in this hall or watching this, uh, I think this is a live event, from their houses. They depend on you, and you will start with new energy this year, new year here at the Eindhoven University. And to all the students and everyone who is supporting them in their efforts, I wish you a very, very pleasant year to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Minister Mickey Adrians for very inspiring words. And we're on to our final speaker, and our final speaker is going to reflect on things a little closer to home. In fact, from a Brainport perspective, can you give a warm round of applause, please, for CEO of ASML, Peter Venick. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, of course, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you here, the opening of the academic year. At, um, I'd like to just look back first a little bit in history. And uh, I think it's especially for the chip industry because about 75 years ago, Bell Lab created the first working transistor. And it was uh, John Bardeen and uh, Walter Bretain, not Breton, sorry for that, uh, sorry. Um, they, t they actually pulled it off. I mean, it was uh, an event of 20 years of research and development by uh, Bell Labs, and uh, of course it was this melting pot of scientific and engineering research and efforts and trial and error, which is so typical in the scientific world, that made it happen. And with that technology, about a decade later, a guy called Gordon Moore uh, co-founded Fairchild Semiconductors, first commercial chip maker. And Gordon moved on to Intel, and then, uh, yeah, actually, um, he figured out that the miniaturization of the transistor happened so fast that he thought, as, as you could say, a technologist in economic terms, well, if it goes at this speed, then every two years we're going to double the performance of the chip. Uh, and we can probably keep doing that for another 15 years, that's what he thought. Well, we're 50 years later, and we're still shrinking. And that's what now called Moore's Law has been an economic driver and has been the innovation driver uh, not only for the chip industry, but I think for society. So if we now flash forward to 2022, um, this is the age of ubiquitous computing. Computing is everywhere. It's in uh, the grains of society. And uh, we don't wonder about the 15 billion transistors in your smartphone. Um, but it has transformed the world um, to a point where it's unimaginable what we cannot do, you know, unless it's unequivocally proven 
that it cannot be done scientifically. It can be done. This is what has this industry and technology has given us. It has unlocked the potential of a lot of industries. Um, and if we think about all the challenges and the perma crises that we are facing, uh, it's true that chip technology and semiconductor technology is a cornerstone in finding solutions. And whether it's in life sciences or whether it's in the energy transition, you think about the rollout of the new energy grid, the smart grid, it's all about sensing technology, it's all about compute. So, um, which is interesting, by the way, that when you think about uh, semiconductor technology, um, there is nothing like obsolete or old chip technology that does not exist because it works in a manner together with advanced chip technology. Because I said it earlier, the world faces major issues, very complex problems. And complex problems need a systemic solution. And from a semiconductor point of view, it means that it's the amalgamation of chip technology that might be 30 years old with the latest and greatest chip technology to be included into a systemic approach to the problem. The bigger the complexity, the higher the cost, and the more systemic approach we need. And this is why semiconductors uh, actually don't age the, semi the semiconductor technology. We need it all, which is a very important uh, thing to remember. We need it all. So, yes, um, semiconductors and the semiconductor companies, I mean, until recently, is very unknown to the public. You know, and, and let's circle back, 1972, you know, oil was always there until it wasn't. And then it became a strategic commodity. Fast forward. 2021, 2022, semiconductors were always there until they weren't. And then it became a strategic commodity. And this is where basically the people now start to realize, people in general start to real, realize how complex and interconnected this industry is. Um, and now also that this industry works in fact seamless. Seamless without borders. We've created this extremely efficient system um, driven by a number of very advanced companies that take technology to the extreme. But it also impacted the geopolitical landscape. Now, when suddenly we started to realize that we're in this new oil crisis, called it the semiconductor crisis, it is this new strategic commodity, of course, government started to realize that the strategic and economic importance of semiconductors is such that you cannot be too reliant on others. And, and that makes sense. You know, if, if 70 or 75% of the world's advanced semiconductors come out of Taiwan, and the semiconductor industry is poised to double in this decade, you know, and the size of European part of the semiconductor industry has dropped from 25 in 20 years' time to 8%, and the industry doubles, there we go back to 4%, I think it's a problem. It's a geopolitical problem because of the risk management aspects to it. So it's very clear that, you know, world economies in the US, in Europe are now looking to recreate chip manufacturing. And um, that, of course, is necessary because it creates then a level of technological sovereignty and whether called open strategic uh, uh, sovereignty, it doesn't matter that much, uh, but it is uh, and the word has been used a lot. It is, you have to think about what's key to this sovereignty. How do you create this sovereignty? Uh, and it's not only a matter of money, because money is probably the least of the issue. Um, and why is it so important? Because semiconductor um, technology is mind boggling complex. Um, and and it's, it's so globally interconnected through some very large companies. So what is needed, what is key? And I believe that there can be no technological sovereignty without global collaboration. And um, the technological miracles in the chip industry are the result of, I think, a systemic integration of knowledge and competencies across a seamless network that's built on te technological extremes that 
are mastered only by a handful of companies. And it's therefore essential to work together. It's impossible to do this all in one geographical area. The complexity of chip technology is simply too demanding. So we need to create a global network of mutual dependency, and that's based on relevance. We have to create a very strong local relevance. We have to stay relevant. And how do we do that? Well, okay, that dependency is okay, like I said, as long as it's mutual. God always needs us. And, and powerful partnerships are not based on power alone. They're based, based on trust. And trust has a couple of elements. First, you need to be able to, why do you trust someone? Why would the Americans or the Chinese trust us and we trust them? Well, you need to be able to do something very well. It's competence. And you multiply your competence with reliability. And I think Thierry Breton said it at the moment that we started to ask for vaccines during the COVID crisis, the reliability went down to a very low level. Have to be reliable. And to be reliable, we need to stay connected. And on top of that, we need to be transparent. So when you multiply capability times reliability times transparency, your trust will go through the roof. But you have to divide that, divide that by a fair sharing of risks and rewards. And only then you can create lasting partnerships and strong and powerful partnerships. And it is embodied in the semiconductor industry because that's how it works. These extreme technologies with this handful of companies is based on powerful partnerships, based on trust. And when that miracle happens, it's exhilarating. And I think a great example is here the Brainport area. So I will finally come to the Brainport. So apologies for this. Um, but it's the home of big tech companies. And it's not only the ASML, it's NXP, Lars is here. Uh, NXP, a leader uh, in its uh, particular uh, part of the semiconductor industry. Cars will not drive without NXP uh, product, the world leader. But it's also VDL. As, and there are many, many other companies that I can name. And on top of that is the 21 municipalities of the Brainport region. Uh, John is here of the uh, metropole region, Brainport, our Eindhoven. Yeah? You know, he's leading these 21 municipalities, these 21 uh, mayors and aldermen. And then I thought I had a difficult job. So think, think about him. Yeah? But it's working together. Yeah? The promising startups, they were also mentioned, scale-ups. Yeah, we have Amber Additive, Smart Photonics, Lightyear. Knowledge institutions, of course, the University of Technology here in Eindhoven, but also we have the Hall Center, and we have the Eindhoven Engine. It's an incredibly vibrant place, the Brainport. And it's nearly a quarter, and I think next year, because R&D spend in this region uh, um, uh, increases double digit every year, it's about a quarter, 25% of the R&D in the Netherlands is spent here. And we're very well respected across the globe for technology and innovation. And it's only possible because we help each other. We collaborate and we trust each other. And it's, and it's only possible because that trust is amplified in this what we call the triple helix. This is very close collaboration between governments, municipality, knowledge institutions and business. And it works together through very short communication like John and I and Robert John, and we talk, yeah? Very open, transparent way, because we know we're good at doing something, we're reliable, we're transparent, and we're willing to share. So we create trust, and then it accelerates. So, what does it mean for Europe? I think what we can do here in the Brainport region is the type of collaboration that fits Europe like a glove. There are, it is, it is wonderful that Commissioner Thierry Breton, uh, who is championing really this inclusive uh, discussion about the future of the uh, European semiconductor and technology industry. He is a big supporter of this. And it's, it's logical because Europe has a unique set of companies yeah, in 
Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, France, Italy, um, those companies are partnering on a European scale with the Brainport region. And we at ASML, but I also think NXPs and VDLs of this world would not be where we are today without that collaboration, that European collaboration. And I think it's key, it's absolutely key, that Europe will play a role in the semiconductor industry. Like I said, semiconductors are such an integral part of the systemic approach to the biggest societal solutions. We need it. And semiconductors as a part it also means, and I think Thierry Breton said it many, many times, uh, we need to be more than doubling up our efforts uh, to grow the semiconductor industry in Europe. 8% today, we have a target of 20% with an industry that's doubling. So think about the size of the challenge. It's massive, but we like it. So, um, I think there is, there is such a big opportunity for the European industry, but also the European ecosystem to be connected and to stay extremely relevant and to create this position whereby mutual dependency as a balance of power is logical. But I think if we think about that, I think we have to, the last point I want to make, it's essential that if we want to stay relevant, um, we need to keep asking ourselves, what do we need to do to get there, to stay relevant, more relevant than we are today? And I think there's one thing that I would like to highlight, and this chip industry, but I think the industry in general, needs a lot more talented engineers. That's the biggest issue that we have. So, um, to fulfill our ambitions, it's our assessment that we need to quadruple the inflow of engineers in the coming decade. And this at all levels. It's not only at university level, it's at vocational level. But let's be honest, when we need to build out the energy grid, yeah, and we really need to build out the grid, there's a lot of mechanical installation work that mechanics should do that don't necessarily need to be at the Technical University here in Eindhoven, but they need to be educated as engineers. That's critical. So I think both the Dutch and the European government, they need to get into gear because it means that we have to increase the, co the collaboration between the knowledge institutions and business and governments. And we need to start focusing on investment programs that focus, and it's been said before, on research and development and innovation. But also basic research is extremely important because it's not only the next decade we talk about 2050, we need basic research support, which also happens and almost exclusively in a university environment. And I think we need to focus on tapping into more female technological talent. That's still lagging, and we need to put an extra step forward to bring that to the right level, which is significantly higher than what it is today. And we need to set up internationally renowned uh, research and education programs, which I think Europe has a very good history. The Horizon programs, the great innovation programs, which we need to continue and even step up. So I'm also very proud to say, and also in my capacity as the chairman of the supervisory board of this university, that I think the university should and could play a model role, because the university has been instrumental in bringing together the powers of the Brainport region and um, we are named by many in the same breath as technology centers like Grenoble, uh, IMAC Leuven, but also Shinshu, Seoul, and Silicon Valley. Now, as my last comment, I think it's brutally hard and complex, the semiconductor industry, and the uh, future of the chip industry is uh, very sound because we're at the beginning of the age of ubiquitous computing. And in many ways, uh, that makes now probably the most exciting time to be working in the fields of electronics and computing science in the days of Shannon and uh, Turing and von Neumann. And if we do this together here at the heart of Europe, and apologies for those who also think that they are at the heart of Europe, but this is where it is, then nothing is impossible. And I first, before I like to thank you for your attention, Let's also think about enjoying this new academic year. 
Let it be a fruitful one with excitement, with innovation and discovery, and most importantly, collaboration. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to ASML CEO Peter Venick. We've heard three great speeches aligning three different perspectives on technological sovereignty, European, national, and regional. There'll be more time to talk about this in a panel discussion in a few moments. But before we start the panel discussion, let's take a little, little look at TUE's contribution to technological sovereignty. Let's start the video. Here I go. Are you ready? Ready to go? Are you ready? Ready for more? Are you ready? Ready for me? Oh my my, oh my my, Are you ready? Ready and now we're going, and I can't stop. Are you ready? Ready for me? Oh my my, oh my my. Hit it big, I got my eyes on the prize Oh my, my, gonna spin the wheel Cash it in and roll the dice Oh my, my, it's a thing of gold All I do is win, all I do is win Oh my, my, no one ever fold Start it up, let the game begin Way up high, I'm taking low I'm feeling right from head to toe Light it up and let it roll Here I go, here I go And you're very welcome back to the opening of the academic year here at Eindhoven University of Technology 2022-2023. As you can see, we made some very quick adjustments during that one minute video, all to prepare ourselves for a panel discussion. So to uh, get things started with the panel discussion, I'd like to invite our speakers and some additional guests on stage in the following order. So first of all, I'd like to invite TUE President Robert Jan Smits to join me from this side of the stage, followed thereafter by CEO of ASML, Peter Venick, then Michi Adrian's the minister, then EU commissioner, Thierry Breton, and finally, president of Philips Netherlands, Sylvia van Es. A warm round of applause for all, please. Okay, let's get right down to the panel discussion then. I'd like to start with you, Sylvia, because we have yet to hear from you. Uh, you're very welcome to the opening of the academic year. Um, we've just heard three different perspectives in relation to addressing technological sovereignty in Europe. Do you think that Europe has indeed been too naive in recent years, creating too much dependence on foreign countries? Well, thank you, uh, Barry, and thank you uh, for having me here today in this great event. Let me first state how important Europe is for Philips. We have multiple R&D sites, uh, we have manufacturing sites, and we have sales and service organizations across Europe. And we achieve 25% of our sales in Europe. Now, being a truly global company, uh, we have an equal footprint globally, so we also are active in China and the U.S. We achieve 40% uh, of our sales in the U.S. and about 15 in China. Now, the difficult question on naivety, um, I don't know whether that is an appropriate word in this context, but what I do see is that China and the U.S. have very strong agendas um, and also invest heavily in technology and more heavily than we do in Europe. So I do think that, it, that in Europe we need to step up um, and to go, if we want to remain competitive in that global arena. And so I think it's very good to go to that next level of sovereignty, as Mr. Breton was saying. I don't think that full autonomy is going to be realistic, but to go to a mutual dependence, and I think also Peter uh, said it, um, whereby we focus on our strengths. What are our strengths? What are our capabilities? More self-sufficiency, but all in a mindset still of open trade. And I do think that uh, the EU should take a leading role 
in, in basically getting to the next, next stage, enhancing innovation and focusing on some key technologies that we have here in Europe, such as artificial intelligence. Um, we need to, uh, uh, we, can, we can strengthen those capabilities and that is really crucial if we look at the future competitiveness of Europe um, to, to come on par and, and to remain competitive in, uh, in this region. Now, we need to have a strong infrastructure in Europe uh, of data, of our critical digital processes, because those will be the foundation for us to innovate upon. Now, clearly, we cannot do that as, uh, as member states individually. We need the EU for that, uh, albeit in close collaboration with the member states, but also in close collaboration with the industry and the private sector in, in alliances and in uh, industrial ecosystems and projects of common interest. Thank you very much for the answer. Well, let me move on to the end of the panel and to our president from TUE, Robert Jan Smits. Uh, Robert Jan, we've heard some fantastic speeches and great insight as well just here from four fantastic uh, presenters and speakers on, on a topic which is of relevance for the whole of Europe and for TUE. So why is the Eindhoven University of Technology today the perfect setting to talk about this topic? Well, I think we are as university at the core of the triple helix model uh, where local governments, industry and university work in a seamless way together. And it's all around talent. The whole European agenda of technological sovereignty can only be realized if there's talent. And that's, of course, the university's role. So I think there could not be a better location for this event than here. And the fact that Commissioner Breton is here, the minister is here, and the CEO of our biggest company in the Netherlands is here, shows the importance they attach to talent and to the young students here present. Absolutely, I completely agree. Now, I'd like to move on to a question that's specifically addressed at both the Commissioner and the Minister. Uh, in her State of the Union address in 2021, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, highlighted the need to link together our world-class research, design and testing capabilities. What is the best approach towards consol consolidating these moving parts in a frictionless manner, and how could this be done without leading to delays in the implementation of the EU CHIPS Act? I will turn to the Minister first for comments. Frictionless. That word is very uh, peculiar. I think that no change can happen without friction, and we should not be too afraid for that. Because we're here today now, we should not judge why we are here, because that's a consequence of what we have been doing, I mean, very successfully for a lot of decades. And now we have to make another step forward, which means that we have to change things, and our, the challenges we're facing are big, so you already said it, it, it also requests big answers, and it is complex to answer it to have some uh, solutions for it, which are not simple, which are not monodisciplinary. It, 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 re it requires a lot of experimenting and making mistakes also. And I think it's very important that I mention this in this surrounding, I mean, because uh, and engineers and, and, and people who are very good at the, at the beta subjects, they, they are very logical in their thinking, in the way they think. So you have a straight line between A and B. But that's not always the case when you try to innovate. You should be able to make mistakes because that's the friction I think you, you mentioned. But we need it to have the, the better solutions in the end. So please make mistakes. Please try to innovate. And um, share these, ideas, these things you have made your mistakes or things that did not go so well as you thought they should have gone. Maybe there's somewhat in what you have done something useful for the better solution. So, I would like to give that to the students here. Thank you, Minister. Commissioner Breton, could I ask you to also to comment, please? One first comment before. When I was listening to, to you, I was thinking to myself, if I'm a student, I will love to work for Philips. It's a fantastic company. It is. I will love, <laughs> I will love to work for ASML. I mean, Peter said that uh, in the semiconductor industry, we need you. So I thought to myself, I will try, that's my biggest challenge, huh, to make you think that you could go and work for the European Commission too. <laughs> even, if you are, even if you are an engineer. So that's my challenge. So I will try to answer to your question with this challenge in mind. Because by the way, we are recruiting 
a lot of very talented <laughs> engineers in AI, controlling, by the way, controlling the GAFA, interesting, <laughs> controlling the algorithm of the GAFA. So we have a lot of interesting jobs. Uh, uh, so now I'll try, to, I'll try to make my pitch. Did you. you did you also bring an application form? Uh, yes, so, yeah. but uh, <laughs> give, give, give me yours, it will be a, a good model. <laughs> but anyway, no, uh, there is one single word. Peter use it, and, and Mickey use it, Minister. Collaboration and friction, mis exchange. So what did we do, or what did I do, as a commissioner in charge of the European industry? I tried to organize ourselves in industrial ecosystems. Yeah. And by the way, it's magic. This is exactly what we represent here in this room. Academic, by the way, I would like to thank the professors. We didn't speak to you, but without professor, uh, Nothing will happen. Huh? And, uh, and so thank you very much. <laughs> Academic world, CEOs, government, commission, we are all here, companies. And see exactly what we did in the ecosystem. And by the way, this is what we did for the semiconductor industry. Yeah. We created a semiconductor alliance. Then everybody was telling me what it is, what it is. Come here, let's sit together, and let's speak. Of course, we had an XP. He was not always the best friend of Infineon. He was not always the best friend of, S of, of, uh, of STM. He was not always the best friend of, uh, of Bosch, even if you are all partners, customers, and, and, that's the, and of course, Everyone was the best friend of an SMA. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> but, but, but we had also, we had also academic world. Yeah. We had research center, IMEC. We had government. Yeah. And we sit together and we said, look, what is our challenge? What can we do? And when we're saying, I want only uh, here in the FDSOI uh, below 24 nanometers, no, forget it. The other one was saying, no, no, I think it's a, it's a fin fat, but uh, not below 14 nanometers. The only one was saying, forget it. Yeah. You need to go to two nanometers because it is the future. And finally, we find our approach. It was a big fight. I said fight, no. Discussion, open, but with trust. And you know what? Everybody has a UPN flag here. Yeah. Everyone. Which is something that I discovered my life. My, you know, I've been a steward, I told you that. But when you were in the US, I mean, Companies were, were understanding what it means, uh, uh, USA Inc., they understand. Yeah. When you go to China, they understand. But us, we were fighting together, uh, uh, separated. And now, I really think that with these alliances and this, with this strategy, we are all together. So that's exactly how we built it. And by the way, this is what I will offer you, the students, if you come uh, to uh, the Commission. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Um, this isn't just a panel discussion. This is a recruitment drive here <laughs> on stage at the moment. Um, um, right, coming closer to Tiwi and the Brainport region, I've got a question for Sylvia and for Peter. Um, it's very simple. For, you can answer from the Phillips perspective and the ASML perspective. Are you working on a strategic autonomy? For the Brainport region? In general. No, no, no. I, I, I hope I made it clear. I mean, strategic autonomy, you have to, what do you mean with strategic autonomy? I think Thierry uh, said it also, you have to have a very clear definition of what that means. You have to stay relevant. Yes, we're working on to stay very relevant. Yeah? Because if you're, if, you're, if you're not relevant, just forget about mutual dependency. I mean, people just, you know, it, like I said it in, 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 my, in my speech, 20 years ago, we had 25% of the world market in Europe for semiconductors. Now it's eight. If it's doubled, it will be four. Well, trust me, it will be less than that because all the advanced and the high value semiconductors will be in Asia. It will be 3%. Are we relevant? No. So I think, yes, you have to. And how do you stay relevant? You, you stay relevant by continuously investing in, in, in innovation through collaboration. Yeah? It's, it's, we have two, two, three hundred core partners, largely European, that are critical yeah, in the success of our company, but I think also critical in the success of those companies because they will attract other businesses because of their competence. So innovation through collaboration, this is what we're focusing on. And to be able to do that, you have to leave something on the table. 
This is what I said, you know, you can build trust yeah, by being very good and be very reliable and, and, uh, and you actually say what you do when you do what you say and you're very, tran very transparent. But if you eat the cake and don't leave any, anything on the table, then trust is a big of a bit of a fata morgana. Yeah? Uh, so um, that's extremely important that you learn how to share. Yeah, that's very important. And then yeah, with that money and spread it and share with your partners, also with the universities, with the knowledge institutions and with your suppliers and partners and with your customers, even with your customers, you will innovate faster because then the ecosystem will become more effective. Yeah? And I, I keep mentioning this word trust, which I think is extremely important. This is how the Brainport region works. This is why John and Robert Chan and myself and Sylvia and a lot of other people sit together very regularly yeah, to make sure that we understand each other. Trust. Sylvia. Yeah, I think innovation is definitely at the heart of uh, Philips. It's in our DNA. It's, it's the, the red thread of, of our existence. Dare I say that some of our great innovations now <laughs> sit to the left. Absolutely. So, uh, so indeed, and I think it was also referenced uh, earlier that we have reinvented ourselves numerous times. When it comes to more autonomy, what we have done uh, over time is that we have organized ourselves and created regional manufacturing sites to also strive for more autonomy, um, and, and at least a level of more autonomy and self-sufficiency in those regions. But yeah, I purposely say that we try to get to a certain level because yeah, we do uh, assemble our products in those regions, but to a very large extent, our supply chain is still global. And that's, I think, also why we're having this discussion that it's good to have a more balanced uh, mutual dependency uh, in the world to, uh, to be able to fix that. Thank you very much. Now, I think we could spend another hour here talking, but I'm watching the clock. And I'm going to ask one final question, and it's going to be addressed to President of TUE, Robert Jan Smits. How will TUE help in achieving goals like that of the CHIPS Act in the short term and the long term? Well, we're already contributing big time to the European agenda uh, by indeed educating talent, um, delivering knowledge uh, to the ecosystem, to the companies. So we do already our fair share. But as university, we're willing to do more. And we are discussing at the moment to grow, uh, to grow and uh, big numbers in the years to come in order to play our role here in the region, but also at national level. Uh, this region is on its way to become the number one economic motor of the Netherlands. It's not going to be the petrochemical industry around Rotterdam, it's this region where it will happen in the years to come. So from that point of view, we are willing to step up the gear and educate more engineers. But, and then I look at the minister, we are a public university and that requires that there will be investments. I don't talk about money, I talk about investments from the central government in this region. So give us the tools, and we'll do the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much, uh, Robert Jan Smits. A round of applause for our fantastic panel, please, once more. I would ask you all to, to remain seated, if you would, for a moment, if that's okay. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> right, it's fair to say that TUE campus is constantly evolving, and in recent years we've seen the launch of new institutes, successful endeavors by our student teams, and new buildings and infrastructure on campus. And right now, there is more change afoot on campus as the new Neuron building takes shape. Let's find out a little bit more about the Neuron Building. Let's start the video. So we're currently at the rooftop of Neuron. It used to be called uh, the Ricken Center in the 1970s, when it was quite known for its huge machines uh, running to support our researchers in their computing uh, efforts. And it's quite nice actually that its origins also connect with uh, its current destination. So uh, AI, uh, you could see it as the artificial brains of uh, the campus. So at EASY we work on AI for the real world. 
Uh, we focus on three areas, that is health, mobility and high-tech systems. We have about 500 uh, PhDs together with 300 researchers working on these topics in a multidisciplinary manner. We also have a large student community and of those students a lot of them are organizing student teams and uh, several are really creating a lot of impact with their AI efforts. It's going to help us in a lot of ways, so uh, it, it will be a vibrant place where students, researchers, collaborative partners can meet and hopefully um, with the help of our demos uh, will well, actually spur innovations uh, together, that would be really great. What makes us unique is that we also take a really multidisciplinary perspective, so it's not only about the algorithm but also can we explain it to the world outside, is it sound and ethical. So the first thing we will do when we receive the key of the Neuron Building is actually to throw a housewarming party. We'll be so excited, so we will invite our stakeholders, our research community, our students all to this building, to Neuron. I can't wait to see you here at Neuron. Many thanks to Patricia Aspers, Managing Director of TUE's Institute of Artificial Intelligence, for the update on the progress of the Neuron Building. I, for one, have to say I'm very much looking forward to seeing the new building on campus. And fingers crossed, I will be on the guest list for what will be, I'm sure, a great housewarming party. Well, when it comes to any new major building or infrastructure, it's always great to have some nice decor for the outside of the building to mark its inception. And we have a placard for Neuron to which we would like to add some signatures. And I think you can all get an idea where this might be going. In particular, TUE would be honored if our three special guests who are seated behind me for today's opening of the academic year would sign the placard for the Neuron Building. And it's now being placed here to my right. I shall now walk around here and make sure that everything is there. We have the pens, we have the placard, and I am looking at our guests here who are on stage. And I would like to ask, first of all, EU Commissioner Thierry Breton to first sign the placard. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Minister Mickey Adrians to step forward and to also sign the placard. Unfortunately not. You may ask questions. I think the question you've, you've posed is a very valid question. It's certainly something that deserves to be discussed. Uh, I would love to discuss it with our panel here, but unfortunately, we do not have time. I am certainly not saying to you that it is not an important question. It's something that should be, as I say, discussed. Perhaps you may be able to grab some of the individuals to have a discussion. Oh, and there we go. Uh, After the uh, absolutely. Of the Absolutely. Thank you very morning. much. Good and it's not, it's not right, a question that we don't want to discuss it. It's certainly something we will. Thank you very much. Could I ask you both to sit, to sit, sit again? And finally, I'd like to invite forward uh, ASML CEO Peter Venick to sign the placard. Right. We have three signatures on this, just to check. One, two, three, we do indeed. What I'd like you to do now, Peter, is just to, to uh, just return to me one sec. If you could pick the placard up. Yeah. I'd like Robert Jan, uh, Robert Jan Smith will come and meet you in the middle of the stage. Okay. And we'll have the handover of the placard and a handshake for a photograph, please. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, at this stage, 
if you all wish to stand, perhaps it would be better for you to stand and maybe in the middle of the stage. That's okay. Whatever suits. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Well, you've signed the placard for the new Neuron Building, the virtual uh, Neuron Building at the moment. It's almost complete. I'd like everyone to give a very warm round of applause to our speakers and our president. Right, we are now on to the final part of today's program, and it is an important component of today's program, as it will involve the official opening of the academic year for 2022-2023 here at TUE. At this time, I would like to invite our rector, Magnificus, Frank Byans to the stage to give us the opening speech for the opening of the academic year. Now, before I start with my talk, first a, a word of caution to our students. You were just invited to make more mistakes. If you want to pass your exams, <laughs> good. Um, where's my title? Drivers of Change. Because that's the title of our strategy document 2030. And in many ways you can interpret this title. But the one that comes to my mind, first and foremost, are our students, our professionals, and our scientists. Because they are our drivers of change. And collectively they hold incredible intellectual power to make a positive difference to our world. Advancing science and exploring new technology is one of the core tasks that we have an integral part of the education that we offer to our students. But a growing body of our students and staff is driven by the grand societal challenges. And I'm so proud of our students that have pushed hard to make sustainability one of our strategic priorities. It shows their commitment to make this world a better place. And change is needed. Next to innovation, growth potential, sustainability underpins many of the grants that we've recently acquired through the National Growth Fund. And low energy consumption of photonic ships is one example thereof. Now these grants will strengthen our research in areas like artificial intelligence, renewable energy, regenerative medicine, and quantum and photonic systems. But we've also acquired prestigious national and European basic science grants. There's a 15 million euro grant which allows us to explore new sustainable polymeric systems. It's a gravitation grant. And it runs exclusively at our university, which is really unique. And top scientists have acquired VD grants, and in this case also three ESC advanced grants. But taken together, it creates enormous opportunities as a university to make a difference. When we were drafting our Strategy 2030 vision, we took both an inside-out and outside-in perspective. And much of the vision that we developed holds today. But we cannot ignore the fundamental changes that are happening to society. COVID-19 is definitely a game-changer. And we still do not have a coherent picture of what the long-term implication on society and indeed our university is going to be. Sustainability is essential. Digitalization is accelerating. And the European quest for technological sovereignty has become a strategic objective. Now all these changes have an impact on our agenda. And there are three areas I would like to discuss today, which are bits, brains, and bricks. Just like everywhere else in society, 
Digitalization is accelerating at our university. It creates a world of opportunities, but it also has made us a lot more vulnerable. So it's for good reason that cybersecurity has been put high on the agenda. Next to high performance computing, open science and open education. But likely the most profound impact it will have is on our education. Digital capabilities have ensured continuity of much of our education throughout the pandemic. But it also has its limitations. And it certainly hurts student well-being. Now the on-campus experience is very difficult to replicate online. And the experience gained by physically participating in a large festival, like say Lowlands, is completely different from watching it online. And that also holds for education. Education is not about content only. It is also very much about personal growth. And that's a fascinating, context-driven process that happens when you're together here on campus. But nevertheless, digital content, online content, has added value. And it will change the way we educate our students. Now, to systematically investigate how these innovations can improve student outcome, we will launch the Academy for Learning and Teaching. It's a platform for educators to meet and exchange ideas. And we've asked Professor Geert Kruse to act as the quartermaster of this uh, academy. But at the end of the day, it's all about brains. Now, the, the growth of Brainport is really due to bits. Some of the leading companies are transforming into digital solution providers, or they offer key technologies for the digital world. And Brainport is a very powerful economic engine that generates high added value. And it was said before, the R&D investments, the private R&D investments in this region are at least twice as high as any other region in the Netherlands. And this gap is growing because of the growth of Brainport. But unfortunately, the public investments are lagging behind. Big time. And this, in the long run, may hurt growth of Brainport. Because after all, access to know-how and access to talent is vital to any R&D intensive industry. But Brainport faces a scale jump. It is estimated that the next decade, at least 70,000 vacancies have to be filled across the board. And we are the key suppliers of engineering talent to this region. We have over 80% of Dutch engineering students that start working in Brainport immediately after graduation originate from our university. But our output is not nearly enough to meet current and future demand. And this explains the urgent request that we have from Brainport to significantly increase the number of graduates that we have by at least a factor of two but if you've listened to Peter, he's asking for a factor of four. So we're currently investigating pathways to enable growth in those areas where the need for engineers is most pressing. But whichever step we're going to take, we'll always put people first and quality before quantity. It's uh, concerning to see that uh, there's so much limited enrollment of Dutch students in the engineering disciplines across the board. And it's worrying that in secondary education, the number of students that elect the natural science and engineering profile is rapidly dropping. To curb this trend, we will invest in our outreach program, but I also call upon the government to substantially increase efforts to promote STEM education. It's critical for the future of our country. Now, beyond any doubt, we fully support the current investments in higher education. 
They're substantial and necessary. But unfortunately, our share of these investments is not nearly enough to enable the scale jump that is requested by Braidport. And not in the least because of the next subject, BRICS. So we invest in our campus. Euron was just opened virtually, and construction of uh, Qubit and renovation of Gemini are on their way. And we've just started the design of our new clean room facilities. But these investments strain our budget to the limit. And growth of our university can only be accommodated with upfront investments by government. And student housing was just mentioned by the minister as well, another pressing issue that we need to solve. So we need more drivers of change. Now, 66 years ago, this university was founded because of the high demand for engineers. Today is no different. The scale jump of Brainport urgently requires growth of this university. And just like 66 years ago, this growth can only be enabled if we have upfront investments by the government. Now, we are ready for it. Brainport is ready for it. And I think together we can make a huge difference for the sustainable future of Europe. With that, I wish you a wonderful academic year. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rector, for those inspiring words for this year's opening of the academic year. We we're all pros at this. Aren't we? We're all professionals. We know what's happening next, don't we? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, we know. Bring the red the button. button. <laughs> Bring it out. <laughs> Bring out the red button. Um, right. It's that moment of time where we have to do the official opening. You, you can plug um, it in uh, and then... Just a little bit of okay. connection stuff in here. Right. Now, the opening, by the way, is about metal fuels. Those who are active in metal fuels know what's going to happen. Philip? <laughs> there we go. A little insight into what's about to happen. Um, I, think, I think we're ready. Yeah, we? you're ready. I think we're indeed, we're ready. So, well, well, let's start the countdown then. Sure. And we have a countdown that should start any moment, <laughs> any moment, <laughs> any count. Five, Five four, four, three, three two, two, one. one. And there you have it, the official opening of the academic year 2022-2023 here at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Thank you for joining us today, whether it's in person here in Eindhoven or online watching us here. We would like to thank our esteemed guests once again, the EU Commissioner Thierry Breton. <laughs> Minister Miki Adrians. ASML CEO Peter Venick and Philips president or sorry, president of Philips Netherlands Sylvia van Es. Before I finish, I'd like to remind the cortege to please exit through this door here on your way out. I've been your host Barry Fitzgerald. I wish everyone on the TUE campus the very best for the new academic year and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much. You want to speak to this individual? Yeah. Is he here? Who's the question for? Is it you? Did you? The question? This man, this man here, yeah.